Hello and welcome everyone. It's great to see so many of you turning in from around the globe for today's live webinar session on diversity. Hope you're doing well and that life is good wherever you are. This webinar series is hosted by Shape Parency with the purpose of educating, inspiring and empowering global leaders like you to help modernize boards and ultimately make boards more efficient. Our expert speakers bring a wide range of leadership and, top and board related topics to the table. Shortly, you will have the privilege to spend some time with diversity expert Penny Wilson, and she will show us how to successfully attract, recruit and retain your board members from a more diverse uh, talent pool. My name is Red. I'm the event manager for Shea Parency. And before I hand it over to Penny, um, let me briefly introduce you to our webinar host, Shea Parency. Shea Parency's uh, philosophy is to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of board and governance operations for businesses. Shea Parency is a new breed of technology, a disruptor in the board industry, a board portal 2.0 with modern digital security, board education partners, and soon to be a series of board effectiveness measurement tools. We are excited about being part of creating the future of boards and board operations. We are excited about you being part of this journey. And like our founder, Ben would say, excited about making boards and board operations less boring. We rolled out an offer for you for you to experience and take Shea Parency for a test drive in your unique environment. So do take advantage of that. It's a free 14 day ride, no credit card required. Two quick things before we begin. Write your questions in the Q&A sec uh, section as we go. Our goal is obviously to answer all your questions at the close of the presentation. But if we do miss your question, we will follow up with you. This webinar is also being recorded and you will receive a link to it via email in a day or two from your host, Shea Parency. And that is uh, also including the presentation deck that Penny will go through today. Now, I'd like to present today's speaker, Penny Wilson. Penny is the CEO of Getting On Board, which is a UK nonprofit working, uh, nonprofit working to change the face of trusteeship. Prior to her current role, she was the director of partnerships at the Brilliant Club and CEO of Style Ability. Penny's career started at the Association of Charities uh, Charity Shop, which is now Charity Retail Association, and Barnett Voluntary uh, Service Council, where she gained an understanding and passion for the unsung impact of smaller charities. She was head of community affair at the University of Cambridge, a trustee of several charities and is currently a trustee of the National Migraine Center. Here is Penny Wilson and improving diversity of your nonprofit board. Welcome Penny to our virtual stage. Thank you, Red. Welcome everybody. And um, thank you very much to Shea Parency for hosting this webinar. I think that board diversity is very much part of board effectiveness. So there's a, there's a really nice kind of marriage there. Um, a little bit about getting on board before I move on. So getting on board is a UK charity. We support people to become board members. Board members, we call them trustees in the UK. So if I talk about trustees, that's what I mean. I'll try and say board members. Um, and we also support charitable organisations, non-profits to recruit board members with a particular emphasis on people who are underrepresented on our boards currently, more of which later. Please ask questions. So as Red said, put your questions in the Q&A pane. Um, and a couple of principles before I talk about what, what I'm going to talk about today that I wanted to run through. So the first thing is that, the, and these are principles that are important when we're talking about board diversity. The first thing is that we're definitely not looking to point the finger or to blame anybody. Um, the most important thing we can do around board diversity is to improve it. So whether that's in our individual organizations that we're a part of, or whether that's part of our wider sector, actually we need to take action. We don't need to waste time blaming ourselves or whatever might be happening at the moment. Let's just move forward. Um, another principle is that a lot of our suggestions are really common sense. So I fully expect you to sit there and be thinking, yeah, 
<laughs> like, of course, we should re recruit openly, for example. Um, but actually, they're common sense, but they're really not common practice. And that's why we need to be talking about some of these practical suggestions. And then a final reflection that often what is really good practice for diversifying a board is actually good practice for anybody, for any board member. So around recruitment and inclusion and induction, actually there are, there are lessons here for general board recruitment, not just for diverse board recruitment. So this is what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm going to talk about the current status of nonprofit board diversity. Then I'm going to talk through why board diversity matters. Now, you have come to a webinar which is about board diversity, so I'm willing to bet that you think it matters. Um, but what's really important here is that we can actually articulate it and that we can articulate it well, particularly as it relates to our individual organisations, so that we can convince the other people around us that it matters as well. Then I'm going to talk about inclusion, so inclusive board practices, what can happen or not happen when we recruit different board members to our board. And then finally, I'm going to spend a good chunk of the session talking about practical tips to improve the diversity of your board. And Getting On Board works with about 3,000 organisations a year, so we've got a really good understanding of what works and what doesn't work that you can learn from. So let's start with the current status of nonprofit board diversity. Now, the first thing I'm going to start with actually isn't really about diversity at all. Um, and that's what people often say when we say to charity leaders, nonprofit leaders, who are you missing from your boards? They'll tend to start talking about skills and knowledge and experience areas that they're really struggling to recruit to. So it might be legal or digital or fundraising or finance. It might be um, expertise in a particular health condition or in social care. Um, and actually, this is still a really excellent starting point when we're talking about diversifying our boards. This should still be the case that it's skills and experience and knowledge first. And there's lots of reasons for this. Nobody wants to be recruited to a board because of a particular protected characteristic. So nobody wants to be recruited just because they're a woman, just because they're under 30, just because they're a person of colour, just because they're disabled and so on. They want to be recruited because they're useful to your organisation. So this, is, this should underpin diverse recruitment. Now, when we say skills, knowledge and experience, when we say experience, we should also be thinking about lived experience, which is the second bullet here on this slide. So that is to say personal experience of the challenges that your organization is seeking to tackle. So for example, it might be that you're um, the organi an organization dealing with homelessness, but you've got nobody on the board who's ever lived with homelessness. And actually, you know, you're really missing really key expertise there if you're in that situation. And in getting on boards research, 60% of charities, 59% of charities said that their boards weren't representative of the communities that they serve. So lived experience is underrepresented and undervalued in our sector. Now, moving on to um, protected characteristics. Um, now, these stats are for England and Wales, and I've looked at the stats for Canada and the US. There are other national um, statistics for other bits of, of the world. And although the picture isn't exactly the same, I think it's fair to say that there is a way to go in every single country in ter terms of its nonprofit board leadership. So in, the England, in England and Wales, um, two thirds of charity trustees are over 50 and 51 percent are actually retired. Women are only 36% of trustees. And by the way, if you want to read up about this, these stats come from the Taken on Trust report, um, which was um, from 2017 commissioned by our regulator, the Charity Commission for England and Wales. People of colour are only 8% of trustees of, of non-profit board members, um, and that compares to 14% of the wider population in the UK. And then other minority groups we've had to clump together because we simply don't have any statistics. So we can assume, for example, that disabled people are underrepresented and actually some small local studies confirm this, but we don't know for sure on a national level because nobody's actually measured it yet. And then moving on to social background, 30% um, of nonprofit board members in the UK have a postgraduate education, 60% have a professional qualification, and three quarters of trustees are from households above the national median for household income. So as a body, nonprofit board members are wealthier and have a higher level of formal education than wider society. And what do we actually mean by board diversity? 
Um, so I don't know if this term, by the way, translates well across the globe, but in the UK, protected characteristics are these characteristics that I've listed there in brackets, which are um, protected under our Equality Act, under the, under the law. Um, so we would all agree that, of course, they're in age and gender and, and ethnicity and so on. Of course, they're included in board diversity. I think for our sector, for the nonprofit sector, lived experience has to be in, doesn't it, that personal experience of the challenges that charities are tackling. I think most of us agree, would agree that social class is in, social background, that neurodiversity ought to be a consideration. And then geography. Geography, I think, is a biggie, actually, for our sector. So it might be that you've got a national organisation, but everybody lives in the capital, or everybody on the board lives in the capital. It might be that you're hyper-local, but everybody on your board is from one side of the track, so they're from a particular bit of town. But actually, the final bullet, we think that board diversity is everything. So yes, it's all of those things, but it's about the relevant mix of skills, knowledge, soft skills, perspectives, ways of doing things, networks, experience, including life experience. So it's all of that, it's the whole mix. So moving on to why nonprofit board diversity matters. Now, as I said earlier, you wouldn't be here listening to this webinar if you didn't think it mattered, um, but we've got to get really slick at articulating why it matters, because often um, uh, you might be the single person in your organisation that thinks this matters, so you need to be able to articulate it to the people around you if you want to see change. Now, I'm going to share a quote with you from the Charity Commission for England and Wales, and I think they summarise it really well, actually. So they say, First, charities are missing out on the widest range of skills, experience and perspective at board, at board level. Charities help tackle society's most important challenges and work with some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. They are also operating in an environment of increasing public scrutiny to continue to make an impact for their beneficiaries into the future and retain legitimacy among the communities they serve. Charities need to be smart, agile and creative. A diverse board can bolster a charity's resilience and give it the best chance of fulfilling its purposes into the future. There's a lot there, isn't there? There's a hell of a lot there. And they go on to say, second, uniformity at board level puts any organization in any sector at risk of adverse group dynamics, including groupthink and unwillingness to challenge colleagues and complacency of vision. Charities are not immune to that. So lots of arguments there about um, good, govern, good governance, about avoiding um, homogenous boards, about being close to the needs of our current and future service users and so on. And then here's a quote from the National Council of Nonprofits in the US. And they say, having a board with diverse perspectives is critically important. Each person will bring his or her own personal and professional contacts and life experiences to their service on a nonprofit board. With a diversity of experience, expertise and perspectives, a nonprofit is in a stronger position to plan for the future, manage risk, make prudent decisions and take full advantage of opportunities. Now, there's lots of studies about board diversity and the benefits of board diversity. Um, and I've given you a link there to a Harvard Business Review article. It's, it's a bit old, but actually the summary of the different research is really, really interesting. And I've just got three bits here that I want to kind of talk through in more detail. So the first one is that diverse boards present more options and are more innovative. Now, this is common sense, really, isn't it? Because if you put a lot of people in a, board, in a boardroom who've all had very similar life and professional experiences, they're going to have quite similar ideas. Whereas if you put people in a room who are very mixed, very different backgrounds, very different experiences, of course, they're going to come up with more ideas. And as the Charity Commission said in the quote earlier, our organisations are dealing with some of the most difficult social and environmental challenges um, in the world. So we need all of these diverse um, experiences in order to come up with the best possible solutions. The next piece of evidence is that diverse boards analyze the evidence more carefully. Now, I, I find this one really interesting. And again, it's common sense when you think about it. So if you go into a meeting and you think Bob and Sue are going to agree with what you think, you might flick through the papers, think, you know, I just, this one's just gonna, this is gonna sail through pretty easily. If you think Bob and Sue are going to disagree with you or each other, you're highly likely to really examine the papers quite carefully, to look at the data, to look at the evidence, to think I better get my ducks in a row about this one um, because somebody might disagree with me. And in doing that, actually, you might change your mind. You might come to a different conclusion. You might notice something you wouldn't have noticed before. 
And then in the final bullet, so most of this research is actually in commercial boards. In the commercial world, diverse boards have been shown to make more money. Now, in our sector, money is a means to an end, isn't it? It isn't the be all and end all, but it does kind of matter to us. So I think that one's quite compelling. Now, let's just summarise why we want to diversify our boards. So first of all, challenge and difference are at the very heart of effective governance. I think we often forget this. We've often forgotten that actually when we're on a board, we're there to disagree with each other. We're allowed to challenge each other. We're not there just to reach immediate consensus. Um, so just to remember that actually we're there to debate and have different ideas and yes, then reach agreement and consensus and move on. But we do need that difference to have the debate. Secondly, as we've seen, um, research shows that a relevant mix of people on our boards is one of the primary ways of building organisational resilience. So why wouldn't we want to? Number three, um, as board members, it's our legal responsibility to do our best by our organisation and a lack of diversity on a board. So a homogenous board is a real risk. Number four, um, as we've touched on already, boards should be close to the changing needs of current and potential service users. And I'd really like to draw your attention to the word potential there, because sometimes the people that are using our services are skewed. They're not necessarily um, the same breakdown as the people that we'd like to be using our services. And it's very hard to fix that if we don't have representation on our board. Number five is one of my favourites. Why would we want to miss out on all of that incredible talent out there? Why would we want to fish from a very narrow pool? Yes, we do want the current board members we've got, but it's a total own goal to only fish from one pool in society. And then number six, and I'm going to come back to this one. This is at the end of the list for a really good reason. Board diversity is essential for credibility, even more so. Every year that goes by, it becomes more and more essential for credibility. But that's not enough. If you're at number six and you're not anywhere else, you shouldn't recruit yet. You're not there yet. More thought necessary. Now, a couple of um, points before I move on to talk about credibility a bit more. First of all, the more you can relate these to your organization's specific strategy, the better. So some of these are quite generic. You know, it's just good governance not to have a load of people who are all the same in a room, in a boardroom. But things like... Um, being close to the needs of your service users, the more you can relate that to your actual mission and your actual data on your service users, the better. So if, for example, um, your, your organization's working on a particular health condition, but you're finding that, I don't know, all of the people that are accessing your health services are primarily white, and you're just not supporting people of color at all and yet they you know you really want them to be accessing your service well that's going to be very difficult to fix if your board is all white for example it might be that you're a community center and you're running you know various clubs and and so on in the center but actually everybody who's using the clubs and the services is over 60 and that's something you want to address and again that's going to be very hard to fix if everybody on your board is also over 60 so the more you can relate it to your particular mission the better Secondly, and this might come as a bit of a surprise from somebody running a trusty diversity charity, diversity might be a word that you want to avoid. Um, only you can know in your particular environment, but diversity can be very off-putting as a term. People can think it's not relevant to me. Um, it's not important. It's something that's niche. It's something that's a bit woke. Um, so you might not, when you're trying to articulate to others why you might need to bring in different board members, you might not use the word diversity at all. You might choose to use other words. Um, so, for example, using words like mix of people or being very, very specific that actually we need somebody who knows about digital marketing or we need somebody who knows about this particular health condition or we need somebody who's had lived experience of this thing we're trying to ta tackle. So the more specific you can be, the better. So back to credibility. Now here is a real board. This is a real board of a nonprofit in the US. And I guess a few questions for you. And by the way, I don't know this organization, so I hope that nobody from this organization is watching. Um, but I would just ask you a few questions about this. What would a grant making trust think of this board if the organization had applied for funding for a program for young women? What would a potential female donor think about this organization if she comes across the, the website which has a picture of the board on it? Or a young person doing some fundraising and looking for a charity to select um, who's going to receive the funds? 
or even if it's somebody thinking of coming to your organization for help who isn't who doesn't look like these people now of course it isn't about how boards look is it this board might actually be extremely diverse um, and this is one of the issues with credibility that actually it is often your judgments are made on on the look of things um, but it, it should be about the connection with potential service users and funders in your wider community. So credibility is important, although it's not enough. And actually that leads us nicely into the next section, which is about inclusion. So I'm gonna share a quote with you from the Charity Governance Code in the UK, which I think summarizes what we mean about by inclusion in, a in the board context really, really well. Um, so they say, all trustees, that's all board members, have the same responsibility for the charity. So they must have equal opportunities to contribute to decision making. Board diversity in its widest sense is important because it creates more balanced decision making. Where appropriate, this includes and centers the communities and people the charity serves. This increases the charity's legitimacy and impact. Equality and diversity are only effective and sustainable if the board works to be inclusive, ensuring that all trustees are welcomed, valued and able to contribute. So that's what we mean by inclusion in the board context, basically making sure that everybody has equal voice and equal power. Now back to the Harvard Business Review, um, because I showed you the research which shows the benefits of board diversity and what this quote says, which I'm not going to read out, um, it basically says you can recruit diversely all you like. But actually, if you don't have inclusion on the board, you needn't have bothered because you won't get any of those benefits if you recruit people who bring lines of difference to your board, but then you don't elevate their voices, you don't listen to them, you're not ready to hear different opinions, you needn't have bothered because you just won't get the benefit. Now, this is what happens when it goes wrong. Um, this quote came from a focus group that Getting Board did last year. So the person said, I left a trustee style role because I felt intimidated around lots of white people. Your voice is undermined and you feel like a minority. If you ask too many questions, you feel like you're being demanding. It also just felt like a tick box exercise. I was like a silent member of the board. There are a lot of power dynamics due to race issues. Now, by the way, this research wasn't even about um, board diversity and inclusion. It was about the experiences of people who've become trustees in the last two years. Um, but we got lots of comments like this. And it just shows that if you recruit somebody into an, a board that isn't ready to hear new perspectives, um, not only will the board not get the benefit, but actually it's potentially very, very harmful to an individual. Um, and morally, we, you know, we want to avoid this, don't we? This is actually, I think, really horrifying. And I'm willing to bet that this organization had no idea that this was going on and that they would be horrified if they realized. So is your board ready for those new voices? Um, and what can you do to make sure that, that you're going to equip people to contribute fully? So here are some signs that your board might not be inclusive. So quiet board members, although that's, you know, that one comes with a caveat because some people are just quieter. Um, members who don't come, so board members who don't come. A whole run of board members who don't stay, that is a huge red flag. Um, that, I mean, one, two and three, the problem is very likely to be at the board end, not at the individual end. Board members who are expected to comment on certain topics only, that's really common. Um, so it might be that, for example, you have somebody with lived experience and you only ever ask them to comment on lived experience. Or you might have a younger board member where you, you say, well, what young people think about this, um, but you don't ask them to comment on the marketing or the finances. Number five, uh, another sign that your board might not be inclusive uh, are certain board members who are very regularly closed down by other board members. Number six, debate becoming very, very personal, or there's just no debate at all. And actually there's a couple of voices that just carry the whole thing. So it feels easy, but actually that's also a real red flag. And then finally, decisions that are really regularly taken outside of the room by a subset of board members. So you've got a two tier board. And by the time the board, the full board meeting happened, everything's already been signed and sealed and delivered. Everything's been decided already. So here are some tips for you as individual board members, what you can do. Um, so get to know your fellow board members. And um, what do they bring to the board? What do they do with the rest of their lives? Um, what makes them tick? Are they OK? I heard this lovely story recently about somebody who was a new trustee and somebody texted them in a meeting to say, are you all right? Are you having a good meeting? And she felt that was just really supportive. 
don't pigeonhole a whole or assume. So none of us are just one thing. Um, don't make assumptions based on what you can see or what you think you know about somebody. Don't, don't judge experience by years or professions. So just go in thinking that you've got things to learn from other people. Don't think that you, that you know more than others. Um, and don't think that people who have fewer years experience have no valuable um, experience. Encourage other voices. So this is a role for every single board member. Make sure that you're encouraging other people to speak. Um, it really helps if you get to know people because you can say, oh, well, I know that Penny had this experience. I think it's really relevant to him and I'd really like to hear her, her opinions. And actually as individual board members, we often, we speak far more than we listen and we really need to have a word with ourselves and become much more open to listening to other people. Check your own behaviors. So some of the things that we do to make connections with other board members actually really exclude other board members. So things like um, shared history, jargon, uh, referring to things that you know, only you would have known with, with the, the other person, but other people couldn't hope to know. All of that really creates links, but also really excludes others. And then remembering that actually you should be wanting to hear things from a different perspective. That's one of the fun things about being a board member, hearing another perspective, being open to changing your mind is one of the joys of it. And then I've got some tips here for boards, um, which I'll just run through briefly. So first of all, make sure, I've said this already, make sure that the people you recruit have the skills and experience and knowledge that you need in your organization, that you're not just recruiting them um, as a token. Nobody wants that, not least the person you've recruited. Think about having a code of conduct. Um, so there's clear expectations of appropriate behaviors. Um, think about meeting papers and other practical barriers that there might be about timing and frequency and location. Um, and give make sure there's a comfortable space where people can say if actually you know I need this thing how are you going to make it for example easy for somebody to claim travel expenses um, without them having to put their hand up in front of the whole board so make some of these some of these process things very easy and inclusive make sure you induct properly I'm going to come on to that in in a while um, make sure that if you're recruiting somebody and they do have one or more lines of difference with your existing board members that you're not expecting them to lead on diversity matters now diversity and inclusion is a professional area like finance or digital so actually to think that somebody who's perhaps an IT manager in their day job is suddenly leading on digital uh, on diversity for your organization is kind of a bit bonkers um, and and slightly offensive as well so make sure you don't fall into that trap and of course you know the, the kind of um, the prize to getting all this right is better board relations. It's people being able to contribute for the very reasons that you recruited them. So there really is a good motivation for wanting to get this all right. So I'm going to move on to practical tips to improve the diversity of your board. Um, now I've got eight tips. It will be music to your ears because all of these tips are attainable for any organization of any size, even really tiny. Um, they're simple and they don't need to cost lots of money. Um, now, if you are thinking about using an agency to recruit your board members, that's great for those of you that have the budget. Well done. Um, and these tips are still useful for that because actually briefing an agency um, is very, very important. So tip one is to run an open recruitment process. Now this is the single largest barrier to better board diversity in the nonprofit sector. Um, the most common way of becoming a, a nonprofit board member is by being asked. Um, and of course, you know, that just means we're gonna recruit more people like the people who are doing the asking. Um, so in the UK, over 90% of charities report that they recruited most of their current trustees through word of mouth and existing networks. Um, and the National Council for Voluntary Organisations in the UK reckon that only about 10% of trustee vacancies are ever advertised. So this method of recruiting necessarily recruits more people like us. Um, it really restricts the pool of applicants. And actually, it also gets the relationship off on the wrong foot often because you're kind of asking someone to do you a favour. And therefore, it makes it much, much harder to say to them, actually, you're not pulling your weight. Why aren't you coming to meetings? Why aren't you doing that thing you said that you do at the, do at the last meeting? So it doesn't get the relationship off on the right foot either. 
And here's a hot off the press um, quote from the CEO of the Charity Commission in the UK, in England and Wales. So she said on the 1st of November for our trustees week, we would like to see charities do more to attract and welcome new types of trustees to their organisations. One simple step is to always advertise and recruit openly when positions become available. At the moment, too many new trustees are recruited informally through existing networks, which risks perpetuating a trustee monoculture. And I would invite you to think about how you recruit staff. If your organization is large enough to have staff, most organizations wouldn't dream of recruiting staff how we recruit trustees. So that is to say, oh, I, I think I know somebody who might do that if I twist their arm. I mean, that's how we're recruiting most of our board members and we wouldn't dream of doing it for staff. So what does a good um, open trustee recruitment process look like? It looks a bit like this. Um, and I'll show you where this comes from in a minute. Um, so it is actually like recruiting staff. Now, tr now, board members aren't staff and shouldn't be treated like staff, but the, the board member recruitment process should be as slick, as timely, as professional. Candidates should know exactly what's gonna happen. They should know where they are in the process. They should know what the timing is and so on. And of course, this is a really good example of where we don't follow this commonly, but this is good practice for all potential trustees, for all trustee recruitment, all board member recruitment, not just when you're trying to diversify your board. Now, you might also want to be thinking about who's leading the process. That's the question we very often get asked. Now, your um, nonprofit executive director or CEO, i.e. your most senior member of staff, should not be leading this process. Now they might be administering the process, making sure the process happens, but actually they're recruiting their own bosses. So they are necessarily really conflicted, even if they're the best of people and they're trying not to be conflicted, it's just too tempting to recruit people who are gonna agree with us and make our working lives easier. So they should definitely be involved, but they shouldn't be leading it. And actually it should be led by at least two, possibly three of your board members, not just a single person. Now on the Getting On Board website, you can find this free guide, uh, which is where that process comes from. And actually it talks through every aspect of the process. And on our website, you'll also find lots of template adverts and interview questions and induction packs and all sorts. So the second tip is to recruit at the confluence of diversity with skills, knowledge, experience. I've already touched upon this one. You're looking for the sweet spot. So you're looking for the sweet spot, but so that the people you recruit are genuinely really, really, really useful to your organization. Um, now, a kind of reminder of how you might work this out. So you're basically gonna look at your strategic priorities, um, sorry, there's a word missing that should say, what are your uh, strategic priorities? And then what might be the bumps, the snakes and ladders along the road? So what are the opportunities that might come along? What are the, the humps and bumps, the challenges you might face um, to get to those priorities? And then look at your existing board. Do they have everything you need to achieve number one? And actually there is no board ever that has everything you need. Um, and if not, what are the gaps? So this isn't a criticism of current board members. This is about saying our organization's really, really ambitious. We're really ambitious to deliver on this mission. And therefore our board is likely to keep on need develop, developing, changing. We're going to have people leave. We're going to have new blood. And that's just part of us being ambitious. And that's something that, that existing board members should expect. Now, I just want to talk about lowering the bar because it's really common when people are talking about diversifying their boards that they think, oh, we're gonna to need to lower the bar. Now, we really aren't. As I say, we need to stay super ambitious about who we can recruit onto our board, but we really might need to re-examine what the prerequisites are for a board member. So I think we've got a very, very fixed idea about what makes a good trustee, um, a good board member which moves me on nicely to my tip three, which is to remove all of the barriers that you can, because every time you have one of the barriers I'm going to show you, your pool becomes smaller and less diverse, smaller and less diverse, smaller and less diverse. Now, of the list I'm going to show you, only your organization can decide what you can remove for your particular context. So there's no right or wrong here, but the more you can take off this list, um, the wider and the more diverse your pool of potential board members will become. So here are some of the really, really common ones. Um, 
Do your potential board members need board experience? Now, some of you might say yes, because actually we've got a relatively inexperienced board and you know, governance experience is something we really need. So you might choose to keep that. In the vast majority of situations, I'd say no, people don't need to have been board members before. And we've already seen that the pool of existing board members isn't very diverse. So actually, if we take this barrier away, our pool is going to become more diverse, but we're also going to need to think very, very carefully about training and induction when people do become board members. Now, do they really need a detailed understanding of charity governance and understanding of their legal responsibilities before they even apply? Or is that something that can be provided through the process and then into their appointment and induction? And then think about some of the practical barriers that are often put in people's way. So for example, if you're advertising and you say, we meet on the first Tuesday of every month at 1 p.m. till 3 p.m. Um, well, that's just an own goal because actually that then means that Anybody who isn't free at that time of the month, at that time, day of the month, isn't going to apply. So why put meeting times in your um, adverts? You can set them when you've got your, your new board members on board. Now, let's just talk about the really, really very fixed idea we have of what makes a good nonprofit board member. Um, now, the way that we recruit, I think it, the fixed idea is that somebody's Yes, they've got useful skills, knowledge and experience. Absolutely. Um, but actually, generally, we recruit as if somebody's already made it in society. They're possibly already known to us. They've maybe got titles before or after their name. So letters after their name, a title before their name. Um, they've probably quite senior in their day job and their day job is likely to be a professional one. So that is how we recruit board members. Now, I've done a really wide survey of what existing charity leaders think makes a good board member. And it sits really at odds with that fixed idea of what we recruit for. So what I was told is that people have useful skills, knowledge and experience that all matches that they're willing to share those skills, knowledge and experience. And that's not the same thing, is it? It's no good having them if you then don't have the time or inclination to share them, that people have time to be a board member. That doesn't have to be a lot of time, but it does mean they need to be available, that they have passion for the cause, that they understand their role and that they're willing to develop an understanding of their role. And there's a general sense of not knowing it all, of actually investing in their own development. So some of the other assumptions we make about potential board members, we often assume that people don't want to be board members um, without ever asking them. So this is some research that Getting On Board did last year, um, which just proves that you really shouldn't assume that people don't want to become trustees. So the lowest rank barrier of all was that I don't think being a trustee would be an enjoyable experience. So these were focus groups made up of younger people and people of colour who are both very underrepresented on UK charity boards. Um, now, these were people who hadn't been trustees and didn't know much about it. So once we explain what a trustee is, that was the lowest rank barrier. Lots of people thought that, that sounded really, really fulfilling. Do I want to be a voluntary leader of a charity that I care about? Yeah, bring it on. Um, but then look at what the highest barriers are. So that the, the primary barriers were, I'm worried that no one's gonna listen to me. I, don't, I haven't got anything to offer. I don't feel qualified. Um, and I don't know how to become one. You know, Practically speaking, I don't know how to find a vacancy. Also don't assume that potential trustees know that they want to be a trustee. So your potential board members may not have already decided that they want to be a board member. Don't assume they know that board membership is even open to people like them. Don't assume they know what a board member is. Don't assume that they know anything about your organization. Definitely don't assume that they know how to apply or what a typical process is. Now, those things might mean that if you don't help them, people from underrepresented groups might put in applications that do them a disservice. So their applications might be weaker than people who have been board members before because they, they don't know how to apply. So you need to help them with that. And don't assume that they know how to behave as an effective trustee once they get there. And of course, lots of existing board members don't know that either. So here are a couple of quotes from um, back to our focus groups. People saying trusteeship is bestowed upon people when they have a lot of influence, power and success. I didn't know you could apply to be a trustee. And somebody say, else said, I see it as an older white male scenario. I don't fit into that category. Now, these 
aren't surprising, are they? To those of us that work and volunteer in, in the nonprofit sector, we know that this is what people think about trusteeship and nonprofit board membership. We know that this is what people think, but yet we forget this when we come to recruit. So please remember. Right, so tip four, get your advert right. Um, here's a sample. I haven't doctored this one at all. It's an excerpt from a real um, trustee advert. Um, and I just leave you a second to read it and, and think about, you know, what would really restrict the pool of applicants here. So you'll see it says, ideally, we're looking for a professional with HR and or law experience and an interest in mental health. You'll have a strong track record in strategic and operational financial management and knowledge and experiences of current practices relevant to charities. The successful applicant will also have the ability to communicate effectively across all levels of the charity. Now, I think you've probably thought to yourself, goodness me, this human being probably doesn't exist anywhere on earth. So it's an enormous wish list. HR, law, mental health, strategic and operational financial management, current charity practices, and being able to communicate across all levels of the charity. So the wish list is so enormous that actually people who've been board members before would probably think, oh, they don't really mean all that. You know, I've got a couple of these things I'll apply. People who are already thinking that trusteeship isn't for people like them. This just confirms all of that. Let me show you another one. Now, this one looks like a role description, but it isn't. It's actually an excerpt from an advert. So it says the role will support the director in implementing the organizational vision and strategy. I mean, first problem that actually the director supports the board, not the other way around. Um, secondly, be a company director of organization name, fulfilling all the statutory requirements of that role and complying with the requirements under the Companies Act 2006. Now, most people by this point are running for the hills because unless you're a charity governance lawyer, you're not going to know what all these requirements are. And it's bonkers to put this in an advert and you know, think that people can't learn about their responsibilities further down the line and then actively fulfill the duties of a charity trustee and be familiar with these responsibilities. Now, the responsibilities can be learned. We can train people in their responsibilities. We definitely don't need to restrict our applicant pool by making it a requirement at the very first hurdle. And then a final one here, um, just to, to show you some of the wording. So exciting opportunity, senior professionals, high caliber of people, very, very gendered, really likely to be very off-putting for people who basically think that, that being a non-profit board member probably isn't for people like them anyway. And here's an example of what I think is a really good advert. Now, it's probably a bit small for you to see. You can download it from the Getting On Board website. Absolutely lovely. First thing is empower people with us. It's a call to action. I'm already wanting to move to read on. It's very clear what they're looking for. It's clear what the charity does. It even has a section saying what they're going to get out of it. Um, it tells them how to apply. It tells them what the time commitment is. It tells them how to get in touch. It's, it's fantastic. So just to pull together some of the things not to forget to include in your advert. Don't forget to explain what a trustee or a nonprofit board member in your country is. Don't assume that people don't that people already know. Um, and the charity commission says trustees are the people who lead the charity and decide how it is run. Well, that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? You're probably going to need to say that they're committee members. You're probably going to need to say they're volunteers. Here is some possible advert wording. Um, so if they don't need board experience, please say they don't need board experience because other, otherwise people will assume that they do need that. Now you can be really specific about what you're about who you're looking for. The more specific you can be, the better. So if, for example, you're looking for more women, just say it. Try not to hide under a stone. Try and be vulnerable, honest. Try and say you're looking to improve your board diversity if that's where you are in the journey. The more specific you can be and the more specific you can be about why you want to recruit certain people, the better. And here's a lovely example from a charity called Flamingo Chicks in the UK. Um, 
and I'm not going to read through all of this, but they I'll just pick out a couple of bits. We recognise that the genre of ballet, they're an um, inclusive dance charity. We recognise that the genre of ballet is predominantly white and are committed to making change. Our work on this is at all levels and we feel passionate that our trustee board should be truly representatives of the people it serves. We're therefore encouraging applications from all backgrounds and especially those from Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. I mean, that's fantastic, isn't it? And actually, if you were a person of colour thinking who was really into ballet, you'd be thinking, you know, there's a place for me here. This, this sounds brilliant. So tip five is about advertising. Um, and Red, um, I've, I've got my eye on time, just so you're aware. So I'm going to be finishing in the next few minutes. Um, now, the way that we often advertise is, well, mainly we don't. We just don't advertise at all. We just ask around. But when we do advertise, we do it too narrowly. Um, and we do need to do some of that narrow advertising. So, yes, we do need to use trustee finder sites or whatever your equivalent are in your country. So in the UK, places like Reach, um, places like Charity Job, we'll need to put it on our own websites, on our own social, to use our volunteer centre if we're locally based and we're lucky enough to have one. But also we need to get our advert in front of places in front of people who haven't thought about being a trustee before. So how are we going to get our adverts in front of the people that we really would like to apply? So that means going direct to workplaces, going to business parks, so office complexes, going to networks and membership bodies and professional associations, um, and really being clever about getting in front of people. You can find professional networks that are built around particular protected characteristics. Here's a completely random sample, just you know, for a quick bit of Googling, we'll get you this kind of list. And this is what um, a worked out recruitment plan is likely to look like for a particular board position. So you've got general, and then this charity was looking for four particular um, kind of professional areas, digital marketing, corporate social responsibility, impact and campaigning, and then a knowledge of infrastructure and funders. And you'll see that um, they just picked off some of the, the intermediaries that would let them get to those people. Um, and then they were also looking for more board members of color. So they picked some particular networks that they thought would help them get to potential applicants. And this worked really, really well. Tip six is about shortlisting and um, interviewing fairly and objectively. Don't get unstuck at this point. It's very, very common to get unstuck. Just try and remember that an effective board shouldn't feel like this. This is a, a cartoon um, commissioned by Diana Garnham that Scott Garrett drew. Uh, it's quite a common picture, isn't it? And actually, let's not fall into thinking, oh, we're going to get on with them. They were great, weren't they? Yes, I really agreed with what they said on X, Y or Z. Um, that's falling back into the old way. So shortlisting, decide in advance who's going to shortlist. Think about anonymizing applications. Um, make sure you're very clear on the criteria before you ever see an application. And that's been agreed with everybody involved in shortlisting. And make sure that your criteria don't disadvantage the very people you're trying to attract. That's really, really common. And try and be quite scientific about it. So set scores, shortlist separately, then moderate, come together with the other people that are shortlisting. With interviewing, tell people uh, what the process is in, in advance, even the questions in advance, or certainly a, a summary of what you're going to be asking them. Think about accessibility, think about panel diversity and invite people to sit on your panel who aren't trustees, if your current trustees aren't diverse. Um, and use the same set of questions for, for all of your candidates. And then induction. Induction is really, really important, particularly if you're pe bringing people on board who haven't been board members before. This is about equipping them to contribute and making sure that they stay. And then my final tip is just do it. Just crack on with it. Um, don't worry about using wrong terms, about being called out. It's best just to be vulnerable and just, for go, just to go for it. Be honest that you're learning, encourage feedback and just show leadership here and do something about it. So Red, back to you. Oh, Penny, this was great. Really excellent, uh, the super high value. I see everybody's uh, as excited as I am here in the chat box. Uh, great content, insights, and, and love the tips. So we're going to jump right into, uh, as the slide suggests, the questions. So if you haven't added your question as of yet in the Q&A session, then now is the time to do so, and we're gonna to try to get to all of your questions. So Nigel is first um, on that um, 
Q&A. What would you say are the top three reasons for charity boards choosing not to diversify, either as an open decision or subconsciously? Subconsciously. Thank you, Nigel. That's a really good question. I think that the primary reason is that charity boards just haven't thought about it. So I think the the largest proportion of charities have never considered who is or isn't on their board. I think there's lots of reasons for that. I think there's cultural reasons about trustee boards not being given the attention and the development that they need about lots of charity CEOs thinking that they're just a nuisance, you know, that boards are a necessary nuisance. Um, And I guess culturally just thinking we've always recruited our board members this way. We've never thought about who's on them, who's on our board. So that's pro- to me, that's probably the number one reason. I think there, there are very few boards who would say, um, you know, we're just, we're just anti-diversity. I, I think that's not really a thing. However, back to um, what I was saying earlier about the, impl- the kind of, um, the the consequences of using the word diversity. I don't think it opens doors. I don't think that most um, non-profit organizations have think diversity is an interesting thing. They think it's irrelevant. They think it's, you know, this kind of niche thing over here that younger people talk about. And actually that's why it maybe isn't the door opener. It's not the right word to start this conversation. The conversation is often, you know, what are we trying to do as an organization and who do we need on our board to get us there? Um, And actually that conversation doesn't necessarily need the word diversity in it at all. I'm sorry, Nigel, you said the top three and I think I've only given two. (laughs) I I guess a third one, because I need to give three now, you've asked for three, is not knowing where to start. So there are, there's a sizable number of organisations thinking, you know, we'd really like to actually diversify our boards, but we don't know where to start. You know, where practically do we start with this? Great. Thank you, Penny. And Jane has a question here. What do you think about shadow boards slash advisory committees? as a way to input more from diverse people? Yeah, thank you, Jane. That's a really good question. Um, shadow boards, I think, are brilliant. So this is um, bringing people on to either watch your board or to have their own board with the same board papers, but they're not full board members. Now, schemes like this, so kind of pipeline schemes um, where you've got shadow boards or you've got apprentice board members, whatever you happen to call it. I think they're, they're, they're really good. It's a really good way of introducing people to board membership. Um, however, my huge caveat here is I really worry about them being used as a cop out of kind of being used as the children's table of boards so you know we'll have the grown-ups at the main table and then the great unwashed can sit at the children's table so I think that shadow boards and similar schemes are only good if they are used in parallel to diversifying your board and there's been some brilliant examples of this so in the UK the Smallwood Trust has got a shadow board scheme that they've written about quite extensively absolutely fantastic and they did that in parallel to diversifying their board Um, Central YMCA has got a broad apprentice scheme, which, again, they did in parallel to diversifying their board. Um, So, yes, just don't fall into the cop out trap. Perfect. Thank you. It's a a longer note for you here. I'm interested in how to work with with a board member who is BSL user and in quandary of the transition translation of this. Firstly, the translations often can only work for 40 minutes. Board meetings are longer. Secondly, payment of translators as trustee roles for us are voluntary. Yeah, so this British Sign Language. Um, This is a difficult one, Ali, isn't it? Um, I think, first of all, the best thing you can do is talk to the board member. So often we agonise over what is, and you've probably already done this, but if you haven't, do talk to them because I think... As able-bodied people, we can agonise over, you know, what is the solution to this issue we're having? Whereas actually a disabled person is living with, they're living with those challenges day in, day out. So they've often got the the solution right at their fingertips. Um, Now, in the UK, access to work can't be used for voluntary positions, unfortunately. So payment for, you know, if if this person's in employment, they probably have access to work to pay for their BSL interpreter, but that can't be used for voluntary positions. Um, So that leaves you with an issue. If you're a very small organization where you don't have a budget, you literally don't have a budget, you know, this is difficult. And I'm afraid I haven't got the answer. However, I think that it's really common for boards to be given no budget at all for board recruitment, board development, 
board accessibility needs. And I think organizations of almost any size um, and certainly organizations with staff, you know, you need to have that budget. And of course your board is the, the, the bit of the organization that approves budgets. So you need to have that budget. You need to have an accessibility and a recruitment and a development budget for board members. Um, and I guess also one final thought about making sure that this isn't discussed at board level in terms of the specifics of this person's specific accessibility requirements, because that's very, very personal. And actually, if it goes into the budget, being part of a wider board development, board accessibility budget, rather than, oh, let's put Betty's BSL interpreter as a line in the budget, um, it kind of outs Betty <laughs> in, in a way that isn't really fair. Perfect. Fiona is asking, I have often been the only woman in the room though much of my, through much of her career. It creates extra pressure that you are the diversity and the role model. How can we avoid this extra pressure for a new trustee or board member who may be less experienced so that they have the best chance of success and enjoying the role rather than being becoming the overwhelmed with the attention and responsibility? Thank you, Fiona. I'm really pleased you've asked that question. Um, I think, that we put too much burden on new trustees, especially new trustees who bring lines of difference with people that are already in the room. We put all of the burden on them. We put all of the burden on them to deliver often, and particularly around diversity, you know, oh, we've got a woman now. What does the woman think about it? And it's kind of horrendous. Um, I think one practical tip I would give you is never recruit single trustees. So if, for example, you're um, wanting to improve the gender balance of a particular board, you know, don't recruit one, one woman at a time. If you're looking at younger trustees, actually recruit in twos or threes. That really helps the individual. It helps them not feel like the kind of uh, exotic peculiarity in the corner of the room. It means that they're much more likely to ask for support. So if, you know, if the cohort of three new trustees is all thinking we could do with some training around the budget, or we don't like this particular board practice, they're a hundred times more likely to ask for help, to ask for changes than if it's a single person. So that's one practical tip. Great. And we're gonna end with Nigel uh, and his question on thoughts on avoiding challenge or having an easy life as a volunteer. Thank you, Nigel. Yeah, that's a really good one, isn't it? Because you know, we, we, become, we become board members because we're really passionate about a particular charity. That's generally why we do it in the first place. And actually part of that is, you know, we want to have a nice time. We don't want challenge. I was speaking to somebody just this morning, actually, who said, you know, I have enough challenge in my day job. When I get onto the board as a trustee, I just want an easy life. I want it to be nice. But actually we've got to go back to things like the charity governance code um, and, you know, the rules of the regulator in which, whichever bit of the world you're in. You know, you only have to read a few lines of them to see we're not there. To, we're not there to agree with each other. We're not there to be friends. Actually, we're there because we're driving the mission of a particular organization and good governance is thrashing stuff out and I don't mean it shouldn't be personal it shouldn't be upsetting it shouldn't be um, we need to be very careful about relationships with staff in terms of you know it's hard being the CEO or the executive director in front of a whole board of people who are questioning you and prodding you so this isn't straightforward but I think trying to remember that we're there to have a debate and if you're stepping into a board where that isn't the norm, getting some governance training, bringing somebody in, reminding each other as board members that actually this is what we should want. This is a good thing. This is for the good of the organization. Perfect, Penny. And with that, I want to thank everyone for great questions. And if we did miss your question, I don't see any more right now. But if we do miss them, we will follow up with you to make sure that's answered. So a few things uh, as we say for farewell here for further information, of course, on Shape Parency or to access that two week uh, test drive that I mentioned earlier, uh, shapeparency.com to enroll in our global education and certification course hosted by our education partner. You can go to shapeparency.com slash board education. And for information on more upcoming events, you can go to shapeparency.com slash events. Thank you so very much, Penny, for joining us today. And thank you for everyone who tuned in as well. And thank you for sharing everything on, on diversity with us, Penny. It's been excellent. From me and the entire Shape Parency team, I have, have a great day and we will see you very soon. Bye now.
Bye, everyone.